I have, I have a mantra, um, which is, you know, that consists of three principles, which is uh, content dictates form and style, less is more, and God is in the details. Few legends in musical theater history stand as tall as Stephen Sondheim. His work was revolutionary, pushing the boundaries on a form traditionally used for escapism, and instead brought to the stage existential characters who forced the audience to think about the world in ways mostly delegated to dramatic plays at the time. Every show he wrote seems to explore a new musical genre. He still holds the record for most Tony Awards won by an individual with eight Tony Awards, winning for best score for his dazzling music and lyrics in shows that would forever change the musical theater canon. Company, Follies, A Little Night Music, Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, and Passion, and a Lifetime Achievement Award. And yet, throughout his life, Sondheim was consistently a commercial flop. In the history of Broadway, only 120 plus productions by composers the likes of Andrew Lloyd Webber, Rodgers and Hammerstein, and Lin Manuel Miranda would play over a thousand performances on Broadway. The one legendary composer not on that list? Stephen Sondheim. As I look back on Sondheim's career, I can't help but wonder why the composer with the most Tony Awards has not had a long running hit. How has no Sondheim show been on Broadway longer than a thousand performances, a milestone most recently hit by both Town and Moulin Rouge? And after his death, with Sondheim revivals breaking box office records right and left, have producers finally cracked the code on making Sondheim a commercial success? This is a story of a composer whose short-running musicals have made a long-lasting impact, of the crossroads between business and art, and of the VHS tape that could be the key to it all. I'm Kate Ranking for Wait in the Wings, and it's time to figure out why Sondheim seems to always flop. But before we talk about all these flops, I want to talk about the bags full of bangers I've been getting thanks to this video's sponsor, Trade Coffee. Trade delivers curated for you coffee right to your doorstep. Sourced from over 55 local roasters, packed fresh to order, and shipped within 48 hours of roasting. My personal favorite so far is Joe Coffee, which is brewed right across the river from where I live. Makes my house smell like a fancy bookshop cafe, and it tastes amazing. With the perfect blend of dark chocolate, walnut, and caramel. Or caramel, if you're really fancy. It even works with coffee pods. Trade Subscription compares my specific preferences to hundreds of different flavors and pairs me with the best one. Now you can find your perfect cup by getting a free bag of fresh coffee with any Trade Coffee subscription purchase by visiting drinktrade.com slash wait in the wings. In 1957, at the age of 27, Sondheim made his Broadway debut writing the lyrics for West Side Story, and a few years later quickly followed it up with the lyrics for Gypsy, two classic musicals right out of the gate. But Sondheim really wanted to write both the lyrics and music, a skill he'd been working on since he wrote his first show by George at 15 under the mentorship of the one and only Oscar Hammerstein, who declared it the worst thing that he'd ever read, but we all have to start somewhere. So it wasn't long after Gypsy that Sondheim premiered his first complete score on Broadway, both the music and lyrics to A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Forum is Sondheim's most traditional musical. A farce at its heart, it's silly and light and easily the most digestible Sondheim show. Hardly having the long-lasting impact to the musical theater canon that his later shows would have. But it did charm critics, taking home six Tony Awards, including Best Musical. Though notably, it's the only Sondheim show to win Best Musical without Sondheim himself getting a nomination for the score. It's also his longest running show, the original production running 964 performances. And commercially can be considered Sondheim's most successful show despite feeling the least Sondheim of them all. This would be the closest that Sondheim would get to that 1,000 performance mark. After the success of Forum, 
Sondheim stumbled forward with the disastrous flops of Anyone Can Whistle and his collaboration with Richard Rogers, Do I Hear a Waltz. The latter was such an unpleasant experience that Sondheim, who thrived on collaborations, would never collaborate with another composer in his lifetime, choosing only to write both the music and lyrics himself. In 1970, he hit the ground running with Company. Unlike his previous shows that followed a plot, Company was a concept musical. A musical focusing on a theme rather than a plot. With no plot whatsoever, Company centered around its characters and their marriages, or lack thereof. And Company was a huge critical success for Sondheim. The production's 14 Tony nominations would set a record for most nominations of any show, a record it held for decades until the producers in 2001. For the producers, the record Tony nominations, best musical win, and critical success would result in over 2,500 performances. But for Sondheim's company, despite its record Tony nominations and ultimate six Tony wins, including book, score, direction, and best musical, company still closed after only 705 shows. No small feat, and the production still recouped, making it one of the more successful Sondheim endeavors. Yet it still fell short of that long-running 1,000 performance milestone. Was Company just too ahead of its time? Company wasn't the first concept musical. That claim is shared between Allegro and Love Life, the latter of which also comments on marriage. Nor was it the first to gain in popularity. Hair opened two years prior to Company, and despite losing Best Musical to 1776, and being steeped in controversy and darkened subject matter, still ran over 1,700 performances. Perhaps it was Company's pessimistic views on marriage. Musical comedies traditionally ended in a wedding, or at least a happy coupling, but Rodgers and Hammerstein paved the way decades before Sondheim for tragic endings. Contemporary musicals of the late 1960s, like Cabaret, a show filled with doomed romances and Nazis, passed the 1,000 show mark despite lack of a happily ever after. But perhaps it was the fact that Company's ending wasn't tragic, but rather existential. Musicals of the 1970s, both comedic and tragic, wrapped up nicely into a bow at the end. Even a concept musical like Hair, despite its groundbreaking, genre-bending score and experimental form, had a pretty clear and devastating ending infused with a smidgen of hope. Sondheim's company leaves the audience with no clear conclusion, no definitive answer on where Bobby is headed after that curtain closes, and definitely no Broadway wedding. And that theme became a trend in Sondheim's work. After the success of Company, Sondheim went on to write Follies, A Little Night Music, Pacific Overtures, and Sweeney Todd, all in the same decade, each a masterpiece in their own right through today's lens. Each garnered Sondheim a nomination for his scores, winning for all but Pacific Overtures, the most experimental and least praised of the bunch. A Little Night Music and Sweeney Todd took home Best Musical, and yet, with the exception of A Little Night Music, all proved to be financial flops, failing to recoup their initial investments. Like Form Before It, A Little Night Music has a clear plot and light comedy, or as reviewer Clive Barnes wrote, A Little Night Music is soft on the ears, easy on the eyes, and pleasant on the mind. The other shows, though fondly regarded by theater fans of today, were met with a sense of confusion upon their original premiere. Look at critic Walter Kerr. Pacific Overtures left him emotionally baffled with no specific emotional or cultural bearings, and he found Follies exhausting and the characters difficult to feel for. None of these shows lasted on Broadway longer than two years. And then Merrily rolled along. Where did they all go so wildly wrong? Well, to begin with, the play goes backwards 25 years from 1980 to 1955. That turns out to be a wrong-headed idea from which the play profits absolutely nothing. Merrily We Roll Along took Sondheim's experimentation in a whole new direction, telling the entire plot in reverse chronology, starting at the end of the story and working its way back. Only a handful of plays had attempted this, like Harold Pincher's Betrayal just a few years prior, and the play Merrily We Roll Along, which the musical was adapted from. But for a musical, this structure was unheard of. Hal Prince's bold vision for the show led the two middle-aged characters all being cast with teenagers, Everyone dressed in identical sweatshirts, and the entire set was designed like a school gymnasium. Needless to say, audiences were confused, and critics hated the production. The show severed the longtime collaboration of Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim, 
was universally panned by critics and closed after only 16 official performances. But even still, it seemed the music was a highlight and Sondheim received the show's single Tony nomination for its score. Sondheim bounced back with Sunday in the Park with George and Into the Woods, both which were critically acclaimed, with Sunday even becoming the rare musical to win the Pulitzer Prize for drama. Both shows, however, would lose Best Musical, Sunday to La Cage au Fall and Into the Woods to Phantom of the Opera. Both La Cage and Phantom would go on to be long-running hits, easily surpassing the 1,000 performance mark, and Phantom of the Opera becoming the longest-running musical of all time. On the other hand, both Sunday in the Park and Into the Woods would close up financial loss after less than two years. As Sondheim entered the 1990s, it seemed his Broadway career was nearing its end. His next musical, Assassins, would even go to Broadway. And in the mid-1990s, one last new show graced a Broadway stage, Passion. Passion was met with somewhat positive reviews and would win the Tony for Best Musical for the first time since Sweeney Todd, but it would also go on to break a record it holds to this day for the shortest running Best Musical winner of all time at only 280 official performances. A new Sondheim musical would never open again on Broadway in his lifetime. A key set of circumstances happened beginning in 1975 when Hal Prince was directing the film adaptation of Sondheim's Little Night Music before heading back to Broadway with Pacific Overtures. Working on a film set, Prince was so fed up with the process of directing a film that he would never do it again. So when Pacific Overtures opened on Broadway, Hal Prince thought, why not just film the stage version instead? With no plans for distribution, Hal Prince had them film Pacific Overtures live at the Winter Garden and his bet paid off, and resulted in Pacific Overtures becoming the first Broadway musical to be broadcast in Japan on television. Following Pacific Overtures, every single new Sondheim show would be filmed in some capacity, and Sweeney Todd, Sunday in the Park with George, Into the Woods, and Passion all had their captures released on VHS. Filming other shows live on stage would not become more common until the 1980s, but was still a rarity and none as consistently as the groundbreaking approach to film each new Sondheim show brought to a Broadway stage. Merrily We Roll Along was the exception, but they knew they had something special in that score and still chose to record a cast recording shortly after its brief run. As recordings of the Broadway production spread, Sondheim shows slowly began reaching new audiences. The shows kept being produced regionally across the country, and as time went on, shows that were once too strange to be loved on Broadway found their audiences locally. Mako, an original cast member of Pacific Overtures, went on to direct the first regional production of the show with East West Players. The production was so popular that they produced it again the following year, and yet a third time 20 years later to open up their brand new venue. The theater company would also produce many of Sondheim's other works, like Company, Into the Woods, and Sweeney Todd, all notably with primarily Asian casts. In other cases, these regional productions ended up further developing the material. In 1985, four years after its brief Broadway run, Merrily We Roll Along had its first regional production at La Jolla Playhouse, where it began an ultimately decades-long process of rewriting and re-envisioning the show to the Merrily that we know and love today. Even on an educational level, the most family-friendly show of the bunch, Into the Woods, is now a mainstay for students. Both the full-length version in high schools and the junior version consisting solely of a lighter, or at least less dark, first act for younger theater groups. As the audiences slowly grew locally, Broadway producers began eyeing Sondheim for revival material. While no new Sondheim show has premiered on Broadway since Passion in 1994, Revivals of both his classic works, as well as some previously unproduced on Broadway gems, like Assassins and the Frogs, have consistently kept his work on Broadway for the past three decades. Were they finally successful? Results are decidedly mixed. In the mid-90s, the first Sondheim show to recoup since the original A Little Night Music in 1973 was the revival of... A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Sondheim's first solo hit, the silliest of the bunch, and the one show lacking the dramatic depth of his later work would prove to be a success again. Was it the star casting of Nathan Lane fresh off the success of The Birdcage that drove ticket sales? Was it the material was so much more easy to digest than his other work? Either way, it proved to be a success. 
Though, while the show did recoup, it ultimately didn't last long enough to pass the 1,000 show milestone. Despite the innovative and starry replacement casting of both Whoopi Goldberg, fresh off of her comedy special, and David Alan Greer returning to the stage for the first time since In Living Color, the casting choices ultimately backlashed. Not for the performances, but for how the casting made the material feel outdated, despite revisions Sondheim made. But could the star casting model be used on Sondheim shows that age slightly better? In the early 2000s, Into the Woods was revived with the star casting of Vanessa Williams as the witch. Similar to the foreign revival, Sondheim, now joined by book writer James Lapine, stepped in to revive some of the book material. But though the production would win the Tony for Best Revival, it would undoubtedly flop financially after less than a year. On the other hand, a decade later, the revival of The Little Night Music recouped with a cast full of a mix of stars, including Catherine Zeta-Jones in her Broadway debut and legend of stage and screen Angela Lansbury. Though again, A Little Night Music is one of the more comedic shows. And still, the production was far from long running, closing after just over a year. But maybe a big star name wasn't the solution. Other Sondheim revivals steered away from the star casting and instead leaning into a full-on minimalist approach. The once originally large and expensive productions of shows like Sweeney Todd and Company were revived with minimal set pieces, trimmed down casts, and in some cases, the performers played instruments to reduce orchestra costs. And occasionally, like with the Sweeney Todd revival in 2006, it worked and the show recouped, but the runs got even shorter. Audiences just weren't showing up in the same way they were for the larger original productions. But perhaps all Sondheim needed was time. While the productions didn't last on Broadway, the film captures and cast recordings live on throughout the decades, like the cast recordings Daniel Radcliffe would listen to with his family in the car as a young child that would instill in him a love of Sondheim before he became famous for playing one of the most well-known wizards. Cut to Radcliffe alongside Jonathan Groff and Lindsay Mendez, starring in the latest revival of Merrily We Roll Along, once a notorious flop, now breaking box office records, selling out the Hudson Theater despite ticket prices of upwards of nearly $900. Or look at the impact of regional productions, like the East West Players 1994 production of Sweeney Todd that entranced a young Josh Groban so much he immediately found a VHS copy of the show and vowed to one day play the demon barber himself. A role he did in fact play 30 years later on Broadway in the latest revival of Sweeney Todd, a production that also broke box office records at the Lund Fontaine despite only playing seven shows a week. But what made these revivals finally successful? Perhaps it was both the casting of audience attracting stars and directors who knew how to make the material shine for audiences both old and new. Or perhaps the solution to making Sondheim a box office smash was just to wait until audiences caught up with what Sondheim so ahead of his time was presenting. Yet, while it seems like the formula for making Sondheim a commercial success has been cracked, will producers finally be able to find the Sondheim show that surpasses the 1,000 show milestone? Or is the long-lasting impact Sondheim has had on the theater as a whole beyond the Broadway stage simply even greater than a benchmark statistic will ever be. Sondheim definitely had his fair share of flops, but none of them were quite as big as when they tried to turn King Kong into a musical. Click on this video to learn all about the time Broadway was taken over by a 2,000 pound puppet.